First, I would like to thank the uh, organizers for the uh, for this great opportunity, which is my great honor and my great pleasure. So here in Shanghai, it's uh, uh, one o'clock thirty. So it's uh, it's 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 quite uh, late. So I will use this uh, uh, pre-recorded video this afternoon, and as you can notice, actually after I <laughs> recorded this. I noticed this um, this forty five degree watermark, you know, from this so stupid Chinese uh, software with my name in Chinese and my mobile phone. So please uh, just uh, forgive this this is watermark. Okay. Um, I will discuss some of our recent work on quantum advantages on computing, adaptation, and metrology. Among many different types of qubits, photons have certain advantages and disadvantages. They are fast flying, have very weak interactions with the environment, so they are very robust to travel over long distance. But photons also have very weak interactions with other photons. So this is also a major disadvantage for quantum computing. A reason why many people think photonics is ugly duckly of quantum computing. Another drawback about photons is that they can get lost easily, either in the source or in the propagation or in the detection. This is a relevant point that will relate to all the three topics I will talk today in collaboration, metrology and computing. In the field of quantum communications, about six years ago, we launched the first quantum science satellite missions, which has now been combined with optical fibers on ground to form a space ground integrated quantum network. You can uh, see this recently published review for overview. Based on the satellite, we have demonstrated satellite to ground quantum key distribution, entanglement distribution, and ground to satellite quantum teleportation over 1,000 kilometers. Using the satellite as a trust relay, intercontinental QKD between Beijing and Vienna was also done with a distance of six, uh, 7,600 kilometers. Actually, in July, we have now launched the second nano satellite for quantum communications with a weight of 23 kilograms, but it will be a few hundred times more efficient in generating the secure key. So, uh, you may ask why developing the very costly satellite? We have been using optical fibers for our internet, and we are very happy. So, why is optical fiber not good enough? for the QKD. The reason behind this project is related to the key drawback of photons being easily lost, as I just mentioned earlier. So say if you have a perfect single photon source operating at a 10 gigahertz repetition rate, sending it through a 1,000 kilometer fiber, then you will have to wait for three centuries to get one photon in the output. In classical communications, we can use amplifiers in every tens of kilometers, but in quantum, the non-cloning theorem does not allow noiseless amplifier of the quantum signals. So the satellite-based quantum communications can take advantage of the nearly vacuum environment in outer space where the absorption is negligible. And uh, so the main loss is a diffraction loss. So at a distance of say 2,000 kilometers, the effective photon loss is reduced by a huge effect of about 10 to the power of 35. Satellite does not actively overcome photon loss. It mitigates the photon loss by creating a new ultra low loss channel. One way to overcome photon loss is quantum error correction for quantum computation, a point which I will come back at the end of my talk. Another much easier and uh, 
uh, very much relevant to communications way is called common teleportation, especially if you would like to travel for long distance, for example, from Canada to uh, Tokyo. Uh, by definition, it's a lossless travel of a particle from one location to a remote place. The idea is to clearly share entangled pair between two locations, and then the photon retransmitted performs a joint projection with one of the entangled pair. Then, boom, the unknown quantum state will appear in the distant uh, photon in the output. Uh, we have seen many uh, impressive experiments on, uh, you know, the so-called long-distance quantum teleportations. However, actually, the teleportation only happen in the local optical table with a few meters. Then the teleported photon is transmitted through, for example, the 143 kilometer or 1,000 kilometer uh, equally lossy channel. So in the end, the photon survival rate remained the same, or actually even lower due to the probabilistic Bell state measurement. And uh, you can look at these two figures and compare. So we could define a new term, which we maybe we can call quantum teleportation or the advantage, where if we can send a photon and it has a better survival probability than using direct transmission. And uh, uh, so standard way to do you know, for the teleportation advantage, should we should uh, first probably distribute entangled photons with high halogen efficiency between Alice and Bob. Bob, which means if Alice, you know, has one photon, then definitely you know Bob should also uh, get one correlated photon. So we need to distribute over long distance uh, high halogen efficiency entangled photons. But we, if we simply send one of intangible photons uh, directly to, to Bob, you know, to the remote Bob, then there's a photon loss again. One way to overcome this problem is that if we can do this, you know, when the photon is just about to, to arrive at Bob, we have this magic quantum non demolition measurement, which means to see a photon, but without destroying it. So how can we implement the QND? Uh, interestingly, quantum teleportation itself is QND. Let's see uh, this left figure. If there's a single photon coming in, assume we have an ideal entangled photon source here, then there will be a double click, and the incoming photon unknown state will be faithfully transported, teleported to other photons. If there's no incoming photon, then there's no double click, and we will know that. So in principle, this calculation in teleportation protocol should work, but there are two uh, problems. So here we assume ideal entangled pairs, but as PDC is not a perfect entanglement, it's probabilistic, meaning there's a probability of P emitting one pair and half of P squared emitting two pairs. So they can be unwanted turns adding up to the desired turns where each of these uh, SPDC emit one pair. So fortunately, we can list all these signal and the noise turns. And by doing some mathematics, we can suppress the noise by decreasing the brightness of the second pair. And we have an optimal uh, success, success rate. When the, equivalent distance is about 100 kilometers, we still have about 80% halogen efficiency. That is the first uh, problem. The second issue is that we need to maximize the halogen efficiency of the entangled photons in order to optimize the separation success rate. So we need to develop a, a SPDC source with near unity flexion efficiency without sacrificing the photon indistinguibility. And previously, entangled photons were usually collected from the intersections of the two bound converted lanes, 
which are, however, not in a good gouging shape and cannot perfectly couple into a single mode fiber. In 2016, we engineered the SPDC so that the two rings are converged into two separate circular beams, which is more favorable for the single mode collection. And uh, uh, finally, there's uh, unwanted spectral correlation, which you can see from the joint uh, spectral correlation. The phase matching here should be adjusted so that you know it becomes circular, which means this you know the frequency is uncorrelated. So in 2018, we created SPDC source with simultaneously 100% efficiency and interchangeability. So combine all these together. Uh, recently, we have performed such experiment, uh, calibration experiment. You can see the setup here and uh, the final calibration efficiency, you know, without, uh, without uh, distracting any experimental uh, loss in productions, you know, is about 6.2%, which is uh, six times higher than the 1% by uh, direct uh, transmission. So this seems uh, promising, but you know some people could challenge this result. You know, much like uh, uh, Pan Zhang and his colleagues, you know, use uh, imperfect fidelity in Google's Sigma experiment, and uh, you, you know, use that to shorten the simu classical simulation time. So. Our teleportation fidelity in the end is also not 100%. It's about um, you know 80, 82%, 81%. So uh, the classical player can use a better strategy. You know, first to clone the single photon into two to three photons with this fidelity. Then you know send the uh, two or three photons. And uh, in the end, you know, the efficiency can get a uh, uh, enhancement. And you know, what is the best strategy? You know, uh, reading this fairly old paper by Nicholas Jason and uh, and and uh, such massa, you know, we can have this equation. So the optimal fidelity equals to uh, this formula. M is the number of cloned uh, particles. So even if we uh, take uh, into account of this uh, strategy, uh, then the classical um, transmission efficiency will be enhanced by a fact of maximum three. You know, as a bond is uh, for two photons, the fidelity is uh, zero point eight uh, six. So even you know if we uh, set an upper bound of three, the efficiency is increased by three. We are still uh, two times higher than the classical optimal strategy. Now let's move to the second topic, quantum computing. Well, as we mentioned, photonics were usually considered as uh, ugly duckling, mainly because of the absence of two uh, of photon-photon uh, synodal -photon gate. There are two remarkable insights which have uh, greatly reshaped our view. One is in 2001, you know, when uh, Neil Laughlin, Mill, and uh, Neil Laughlin and Melbourne proved that linear optical quantum computing is in principle possible, although with a dampening high precision and a huge ov uh, overhead. Uh, today, with uh, later developments, especially the class state quantum computing, the overhead is greatly reduced by effect of uh, three order magnitude, but it is still uh, fairly, fairly out of the reach of the current technology, uh, despite some of the bold claim from, uh, for example, by Thompson. And another remarkable result, and a very surprising result, was from uh, Scott Allison and his student Alex Akhtov. She designed a quantum device called a boson sampling and proved that it can solve a problem that no classical computer can solve in a reasonable amount of time. So boson sampling experiment is much, much simpler than the KL, KLM scheme. We just need a race of quantum light source, a large interferometer, 
and uh, the detection is purely passive. So the biggest headache in KOM such as active, active feed forward and uh, fairly demanding requirement of efficiency and uh, fidelity, and also in other schemes, uh, some photon photon interaction is removed. And uh, the boson sampling schemes set a very attractive goal in the community. Achievable goals, the first step to self improvement. <laughs> so, while the uh, boson sampling proposal only require, you know, a high quality 50 to 100 photons, about uh, six order magnitude lower than, than for example, running a non trivial choice algorithm. They can actually provide a more compelling theoretical uh, complexity theoretical evidence for the quantum computer unit speed up because the mathematical problem related to sampling are uh, uh, in computational complexity language is much more difficult than uh, for example factoring and uh, so this protocol attracts a lot a lot of people uh, including myself. Uh, but when we started to seriously consider a large scale boson sampling in 2013, we collected the best figures of knowledge in the single photon source, so in the filter and the detection. And if we assume we can compatibly put them together, so still, uh, 30 photon coins combined would be 10 to the power of uh, 100. And why this is so? Difficult, and let's hear what Scott said about the challenges. You know, so uh, so what is the difficulty in scaling this up? Why haven't you know the uh, quantum optics people done it with with thirty photons yet? Okay, well uh, the uh, the central difficulty is that you know you need all n photons to arrive at your photo detectors at the same time. Okay, that's the only way that you're going to observe an n photon you know interference effect. Maybe if you had super duper reliable you know single photon sources okay uh, unfortunately those don't exist yet so uh scott is right we need to develop a super duper reliable uh single photon source and ideally you know it should simultaneously fulfill the following checklist the so generation collection and detection should have high efficiency the emission should have near zero multiple photon probability and uh, the photons should be identical to each other in all degrees of freedom. You know, usually experimentally, you know, achieving this checklist individually is easier, but to get them all working together simultaneously is much more difficult. And uh, this is not only in boson sampling, but also in uh, all systems of uh, quantum computing experiments because they have to fulfill the five or seven different chances criteria and uh, some of these criteria can even you know contradictory to each other for example the, the coherence and the computability is usually you know they don't uh, uh, like each other so first we need to fix the uh, indistinguibility of the single point source uh, and for quantum dot source, you know, it usually strongly rely on the method of optical excitation. And the previously the predominant use method is non resonant excitation, which cause uncontrolled time jitter and electric field fluctuation, which fundamentally limited the two photon interference with visibility below 60%. To solve this problem, we developed pulsed resonant excitation, which directly drive the two-level system and so uh, avoided the time jitter. And as you can see, the pi pulse uh, laser power is only a few nanowatts, which is four order magnitude lower than non resonant excitation. So with this, the photon indistinguibility was increased to 66.5%. The next problem is photon collection. So to make the emission predominantly directional, we couple the emitter in a micro pillar cavity. The emitter lifetime is shortened from about 700 picosecond of lengthens 
to about 80 picosecond on resonance with a Poisson fact of about 10. So the extraction efficiency is increased from 1% at bulk, bulk structure to about uh, uh, 66%. We have a uh, uh, better number now compared to five years ago. So this is uh, encouraging because uh, in the extract efficiency, but extract efficiency is not everything, it's not the end of the story. So the use of resonant excitation, which made the photon quality almost perfect, came with a price. Why? Because the photon, so the laser is exactly the same wavelength as a single photon. So we have to use polarization filtering to suppress the laser leakage, which at the same time caused an efficiency loss of at least 50%. So we designed a new protocol that solves the two problems simultaneously. Instead of uh, using a symmetric cavity, we employ an elliptical microfiller cavity that split the cavity mode into two non-degenerate linearly polarized mode. We put the emitter on resonance with the horizontal cavity mode, so most of the generated photons will be funneled into the horizontal. Second, we excite with vertical and collect with horizontal. So there's no photon loss due to a polarization filtering. Uh, you can see this left figure is the actual elliptical micro pillar sample we fabricated. So finally, we can generate polarized single photons with simultaneously high efficiency, purity, and indestructibility. Uh, in principle, we can put them all together, but uh, much more engineering work should be done to make them, you know, uh, perfect. Now, how about in the field meter? It also has, uh, it also must uh, simultaneously fulfill a number of checklists. High transmission rate, because every photon matters. Random metrics, because we need to ensure the problem is hard. Work connectivity so that the match cannot be reduced to smaller ones. We have tried uh, different types of interfilter meters. One is by combining the micro optics with intermolecule force. And the feature here is high transmission rate over 99%. The second one is time beam encoded fiber loop following an early proposal by our much missed friend uh, Johnson Dowling and his co-workers. The feature here is fully electronically programmable. The loss, however, is uh, high, about 20% of loop. So at that time, we cannot afford too many loops. We tried uh, four to five. Uh, uh, this year, Xenadu has a much clever scheme that they use only three loops to induce non-local uh, entanglement. So in 2019, we scaled up to 20 photons and 60 mode three-dimensional in the field mode, which have output state space dimension up to 10 to the power of 14. So currently, we continue to optimize the single photon source. We have now more than 15 million single photon count per second with um, system efficiency of about 72%. And uh, by the way, this surpasses uh, loss tolerance threshold uh, scheme raised by uh, uh, Taylor Rudolph and his colleagues. Considering purely photon loss, uh, not as a depolarization error. So, so originally, you know, why we push for the 10 to 30 uh, regime, photon regime, because this was uh, shown early, should be sufficient to show quantum speed up, however, in 2017, a classical algorithm improvement raised the bar to about 50 photons. So how to go beyond 50? So interestingly, there's a highly uh, efficient scheme called a Gaussian boson sample. And here's the important feature is, while most the previous multi-photon experiments with SPDC were afraid of the multi-pair emission, you know, many of the audience who uh, perform experiment with SPDC, you know, we have to make sure the laser power is, you know, 
no, not a too strong, so that the, the P is usually smaller than a few percent. And uh, those experiments can only exploit the tip of iceberg of SPDC. However, GBS uh, very nicely overcomes this uh, limitation. How it works? So in the original boson sampling, we can see that there are many possible paths that leads to a certain multi-photon coincidence. For example, from input 1, 2, 3, 4, to output 1, 3, 4, 7. There are more than 20,000 possible paths adding up together. So in GBS, instead of using single photons as input, GBS uses squeeze vacuum. And uh, squeeze vacuum is just a completely superposition of different even photon number state with a fixed phase relation from k equal to zero, zero photons, two photons, four photons, six photons, and so on. So the GBS can, you know, what the GBS brings in on top of the different past superpositions, which I just showed uh, in, the, in, in the previous slide, is that there's also different input photon number combinations. For example, if we detect four photons in the output, it can come from different uh, paths, but also it can from, come from combinations of different photon numbers. For, for example, the first one has four photons, k equals to two. The second one, zero, zero, zero. Or, you know, two, two, zero, zero. Or two, zero, uh, zero, two. So there's also photon number superpositions. And, uh, you know, this is a way I, I find it convenient to explain GBS for discrete level, a discrete variable optics people. For a continuous variable, you know, they have more, uh, more subtle understandings. So now from the idea to experimental implementations. In the first experiment, we sent 50 single mode squeeze state into 100 mode in field meter and this output. And in the second one, in, in the field meter is increased to 144 mode. And uh, from idea to experiments, there's a number of new challenges, including the source uh, in the field meter, phase locking, which I explain uh, in detail. So first we need 50 single mode squeeze state, and they should have uh, simultaneous high level of um, indistinguibility and efficiency. So we use a custom designed pulse laser with a repetition rate of 230 kilohertz instead of the routinely used about 80 megahertz to generate a much higher peak power. We use the deformable mirror to compensate the high order dispersion in this commercial laser. So we made a lot of effort in how to make the to, to redesign and uh, to, to tailor the commercial laser into our, our machine. And you can see the intensity, the audible spectrum, you know, it's transform limited. You can see the intensity and the phase data. So the laser is split into 25 paths and focus on 25 dpkdp crystals. And you can see the, uh, uh, you know, frequency uncorrelated. And uh, we also follow idea from laser and we design stimulated uh, squeeze light. And so we double pass the laser into the crystal to make more efficient use of the laser power. So in this way, we generate the squeeze light source with higher brightness, purity, and efficiency, as you can see from uh, so these two plots, and uh, we can, in the future, we can scale to even higher order of uh, stimulated SPDC. And uh, interestingly, when, when we are developing the stimulated SPDC uh, squeeze light, there's actually a spin-off application on silver sensitive in the phase measurement. So the stimulated squeezer can actually be seen as a non-linear in the field meter, which can measure an unknown phase and gives uh, unconditional, stable, and robust phenomenological advantage. 
uh, the method here follows the thin scaling as a known state to reach the Heisenberg limit. But the actual performance is much more robust than the known state because uh, it has high tolerance to the external noise at the photon loss. For example, to actually show an uh, unconditional advantage for about 10 photons, you know, for the known state, it must have very high, about 90% efficiency. But um, using this scheme, you know, they can tolerate up to 99% photon loss. So in our initial experiment, we have directly observed uh, about a uh, six-fold enhancement above the short noise limit in the fish information expected by a uh, photon. Uh, and this is without discounting for any photon loss and imperfections and uh, can even outperform ideal five photon moon state. Ideal meaning it's created deterministically and measured, you know, with 100% efficiency and then there's no loss in the in the circuit. Now back to uh, the GPS. So unlike the original uh, boson sampling where there's no phase relation between the source, so the GPS requires phase control of all photon number states from the uh, crystals to the interferometer. So we develop active phase blocking for each optical pass consists of 20 meter optic fiber and a two meter of free space. And uh, the overall drift is controlled within uh, 15 nanometers, which is only 1% of the wavelength of the, the photons. So the whole setup looks like this. You know, for the first version, this is uh, the commercial made laser system to the corner light source. Each are collected into optic fiber, which are wound along the PSO for face locking, and now then goes into this in the field meter. Actually, the design of the geometry here is precisely what we arrange in actual optical table. So you know, this is uh, the most compact way we can we can think about. And as a second version, we use stimulated uh, squeeze light, which you can see from here. And it's a, in a few meter goes to three dimensional because there's no more mode. So uh, this is animation that uh, reproduce actual optic uh, table. And uh, because of the COVID-19, you know, we, uh, we haven't been able to travel for the, in, the, in, in the past three years. And uh, I hope in the near future, you know, our lab can welcome uh, all of you to, to, to visit. So optic uh, so output photon distribution at a different laser power is shown here. So at the highest laser power, the maximum photon clip is 113. We also measure low power data where the maximum clip is about 20. So everyone is um, welcome to play with our low data. So because for 20 photons, you know, you can just play with your laptop. But if the photon number is more than 40, then you have to rent a supercomputer. And uh, the tens of gigabytes raw data is shown in this um, in this link, and has been made available. 
So verification of uh, boson sampling is per perhaps even more challenging than experiment and have attracted ongoing effort. Uh, unlike Shaw's algorithm, a full certification of GBS is itself intractable for classical uh, computation, at least you know, we believe today. So what we can do at the moment is to first calibrate the experimental parameters and to provide evidence to the quantum nature of the GBI device to rule out possible hypotheses. And uh, possible hypotheses include thermal state, Swiss thermal state, distinguishable photons, and so on, which can result from photon loss or you know, mode mismatch. So uh, in the GBS, there's no perfect one single metric that can fully validate the data, but a lot of the collection of uh, anal analysis tools. And one of these is called a Bayesian test. So we define Bayesian uh, test strength, delta H. If delta H is positive, uh, well, it depends on you know, the definition you know, on your sign. Then it means experimental samples are more likely to be generated by a GBS machine than the mockup. So we can look up our system. We first uh, investigate a subsystem with fewer output, output bosonic load. Say, you know, there's yeah, in total 144 mode, but we first look at the 80, and then we increase to 90, 100. From the data, we can show we can not only rule out the thermal and di distinguishable mockup in the subsystem, but also we can see that the strength of the validation becomes stronger when the subsystem mode number increase. So it's reasonable to infer that the validation will succeed in the supremacy regime where we can not compute uh, directly. Another useful intuition, which we proved experimentally, you can see these two uh, uh, testable origin data, is that you know due to the classical computing power, you know we usually test the region which have smaller photon number, which is uh, left slope of this photon number distribution here. This region shares a thin set setup as higher photon number uh, experiment, the light slope, but, but effectively suffers from more photon loss, higher you know, photon loss. So in the condition of the thin input for, uh, number, photon numbers, so we can deduce that at higher photon region, you know, the hypothesis that uh, related to photon loss will be ruled out with even higher confidence as uh, other proof in these two figures. <clears throat> so as we load in the you know, first paper, we hope this work will inspire new selective effort to verify large scale GBS, improve the uh, classical simulation strategies. So we, we share our data and hope to uh, inspire new efforts. And indeed, there are a lot of interesting classical algorithms improvement and spoof. Uh, one is from Google. The idea is to artificially generate mock-up samples based on only one order and two order correlations. And they have shown better total value distance on small scale subsystems, but uh, didn't show a uh, high order correlation as an example and also didn't show uh, for larger systems. So we are also making progress in improving the calibration of the metrics and hopefully it will beat the, this mockup. The, the, the second, the most recent spoof attack is from <coughs> Nicholas, so, uh, who will give a talk later. So they came up with a squash state, which is maximally similar to our target squeeze state and it shows that as a squash state can have very similar high order correlation. And they also try uh, even more tailored attack by modifying the squeezing parameters, you know, different to the actual experimental parameters. 
and to check whether it can generate higher uh, Bayesian test score uh, than the experimental samples. So for Jiuzhan Chu, the data, you know, the experimental sample score is higher. And uh, we, we have also include the, a more precise corner choose by calibrating the thermal noise in the system. And we can show, you know, as in the latter data point, the advantage of the experimental samples can get even higher. And as pointed out by many people, you know, quantum supremacy is not a single short achievement, but have to be refined over time to uh, eliminate loopholes because uh, smart people will come up with better and better classical algorithms. This is um, in spirit very similar to the Bell test history, which lasted for 40 years and there's still ongoing efforts, for example, to eliminate the freedom of choice, free will, something like that. Maybe people think some of these are paranoid. One last point I would like to mention is that the GPS machine is partially programmable. Uh, we demonstrated last year. So uh, because the phase amplitude and amplitude of the input speed state is also included in the matrix and it can be tuned. So we can try to solve different uh, mathematical problems. <clears throat> and uh, finally, you know, what's next? We hope to make the interferometer fully tunable and uh, to find possible applications, demonstrate for tolerant PV, PKP code. And there's the next round of quantum supremacy, as recently talked by uh, Scott Allison a lot, is that, you know, they should have much higher fidelity, lower loss, and the more valuable. One candidate uh, we are interested in is IQP. Uh, using either superconducting system or, you know, uh, atomic arrays. And uh, on photons, I think the next biggest challenge is how to uh, develop deterministic photon photon signal gate, which is, uh, which is a new direction of uh, my research, my future research. And my group is also interested in investigations of fundamental problems in quantum mechanics. For example, recently we do out real number quantum theory. And uh, in addition, our group also uh, reproduced Google Sigma result with, but with larger size with 56 and 60. So this comes to the end of my talk. Many people have made significant contributions to this work. Over the years, we have received uh, support from many colleagues and friends. And I'm just talking uh, presenting the work, but the real heroes are my students and the postdocs who did the hardest part of the work, and it has been a great fun to work with these uh, brilliant minds. And with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, attention. Thank you very much.